everyone. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, thank you for having been uh, with us through this uh, very interesting uh, afternoon. And uh, to conclude this first day of this workshop on the technology transfer in life sciences, I would now like to welcome to the podium uh, Jan Matai, who is the director of Human Technopol. Most of you will know them already. He's, uh, he's been leading this institute right from the start after a long uh, uh, experience as director of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And uh, he will give us, offer us some conclusion for the day. And okay. Welcome. Thank you very much, Nicola, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'd, I'd also like to thank the partners, Youth, Netval, and particularly Fabio and Marika, who have put a lot of work into organizing this meeting. And uh, as I, I was just saying to the, the speakers before we started, that um, I, I've been in a meeting of our board for the... the, the I'm not going to tell you whether it's spelled B-O-A-R-D or B-O-R-R-E-D, but I've been in a board meeting all afternoon and it was so interesting that I actually was able to follow the talks. And uh, so I thank all three of the speakers who, who participated in the first session and Nicola for his moderation. Uh, I thought it really was a very interesting and, and broadly based range of messages about technology transfer which are very important to um, particularly to inform people who are interested in developing their research towards innovation uh, uh, to here um, and it, it's I think that the, there is you know this is not unique to Italy but I think the country is often quite pessimistic in, in presenting itself. Um, but I think there are really uh, good grounds for hope uh, that uh, there will be a more good developments in this area in the country. The, the Milan area, of course, is famous for startups, and of course, San Rafael is one of the drivers of these startups. Um, but I noticed a couple of weeks ago, in, buried in an article which was talking about how depressing it was that the ERC grant awardees in Italy, or the Italian ERC grant awardees, were almost all not in Italy. To see that, in fact, Italy, Italians in Italy, were the second largest national group for proof of concept grants. In other words, people are interested in obtaining funding to, to cross the so-called valley of death between having made a discovery and getting to the point where you may be interested, you may be able to interest investors in, in uh, funding this to, to develop it further towards uh, the market. So I think there are, as in many things, I, th I think the picture is not by any means a black one. So I, I, I don't have very much that's original to say. You already had three very good and very experienced speakers talking previously, and Nicola's introduction obviously showed his familiarity with the, 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 the topic of technology transfer. But there are some things I'd like to see from my experience. Um, and I'll, I'll come to my experience later and, and where it came from. But I think there is a, a progressive change in the culture of research uh, and research institutions and individual researchers. I think there are um, that there, is, there are real blocks to the system in some countries, and, and Alessandro men mentioned, um, sorry, Ricardo mentioned professorial privilege uh, as being one of the real blocks to innovation in some countries. And when I arrived in Germany, which was a long time ago, in 1984, professorial privilege existed in Germany. In fact, it hasn't been abolished to this point, but many universities uh, 
who are in many of the advanced universities have found ways around this problem. And I, obviously in Italy the same thing is true, that some of the universities have very good systems for technology transfer in spite of having this legal block to, to, the, to the, exploit, the, 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 the easy exploitation of discoveries. So, the, this change in culture is taking place. Why is it changing? Why is it, why is it necessary? Why is it important? And why are things changing? I think, from my point of view, the, there are two major drivers. I think it's very important for places that do excellent research to demonstrate the value of research towards society. And there are different ways of doing this, communicating about research and communicating about the results of research broadly is one thing. Um, but contributions to society through innovation are another. And I think there are places which are where it's very obvious if you work in a, a, a hospital-based institution, and again, San Rafael is a super example, if you can work together with foundations, with companies, and with your clinical colleagues to develop discoveries that are made in research into treatments, this is, this is fabulous. What, what better news could there be for society than the development of, of new treatments. And you know, it's obvious that I'm an RNA biologist, more or less by genetics. And uh, it, it's obvious I would, I would mention mRNA vaccines. I worked on mRNA and other forms of RNA for 25 years. And I'd like to think in a small way like many, many, many other people who worked in this field, that I made a contribution to the fact that it was possible, you know, 70 years after the discovery of messenger RNA and, and the genetic code and so on, uh, that they can be used in this innovative way. And I want to emphasize using this example also that these mRNA-based vaccines have played a fantastic role in getting us to the, 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 the increasingly comfortable position, still uncomfortable, but increasingly comfortable instead of getting worse situation in regard to SARS-CoV-2. Um, but, you know, it, good science and good applied science raises also the next question. And the next question is, you know, the, the delivery efficiency of the messenger RNA and the delivery method of the messenger RNA that's used in mRNA vaccination is, is from the Stone Age. You know, you have this fantastic tool and you wrap it in, in, in globs of fat and stick it into people. And at an incredibly low efficiency, the messenger RNA is taken up by cells and used. And the next challenge in this area, and this is actually in, in I think, it's, the, it's probably one of the biggest challenges in all area of drug development, is efficient targeting, efficient and accurate targeting to the cells that you want to hit. It's, a, it's been a problem that's been around for, I don't know, how, it probably 35, 40 years since people started to think seriously about this. And, and we, we have made zero progress because there isn't funding for the basic cell biology that would be needed to help move this in an innovative sense, in a sense of using the information forward. So there's always more to do and there's always more research to do. Don't worry about it. Um, the, other, the other reason I think it's really good that there's a change in culture towards innovation is because it, it's a lot of fun. 
it's, it's, scientists are by nature curious people. Um, I was a company founder in the 90s. Um, the, 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 I discovered all sorts of interesting and bizarre things about venture capitalists, um, including being involved in a reverse takeover where our company, with no money but some good ideas, took over a company that was worth a hundred million dollars by force of personality. Uh, you know, this is not the world of science. You can't do things like that in science. But working with these people and seeing how they operate, and actually this company, the company, not to any financial benefit of mine because I had, like Luigi, I think, I, I started as a founder when the company actually came into existence. I was a scientific advisor and my contribution to the company was diluted to such a level that by the time the company was sold to Roche for, I think it was sold for 270 million, you know, I could buy myself a dinner with, the, with, with my share of the profits. So, but it, it, it still, it, it gives you an opportunity, it gives you an insight into a world that otherwise you would know nothing about. And it's, it, it's just interesting, it's fun. To, to find out about new things. And it also got me a lot of free business class flights to, to La Jolla because the company ended up being based in La Jolla. And if you've never been to La Jolla, it's worth going there even if you have to go to board meetings. So, um, aside from that, the other thing I'd like to emphasize, and again, this is not something that's new, it's been said in different ways by by different people already this afternoon and probably will be repeated tomorrow, is, is the, how difficult it is to have good technology transfer professionals working with scientists. So this, the initiative that Fabio is leading for us is related to aspects of technology transfer. Um, but it's it, and it's it's but it's a very complicated process. You need to have people who really understand the science. They they're not the scientists. They have to work with the scientists. But if they don't understand what the scientists are saying, the project will never get anywhere. So they really need to understand science. Some of them. They need to understand what's worth protecting. When is it worth to generate IP and when isn't it worth that? Because protecting IP is expensive and institutions, institutes and universities can only afford to protect a certain amount of intellectual property. And the technology transfer professionals are the people who have to give advice on what to protect and what not to protect. And that can be very hard for the individual scientist who makes a discovery and is told that we don't think it's worth to protect it. But if the institutions divide their budget among all the projects which would like to have funding, none of them will ever be protected properly. So those, the, the technology transfer professionals need to do this. They need to take over from the scientists. The scientists should just talk to the technology transfer professionals if they're interested to do this, and it's an interesting thing to do in my opinion, but not everyone is. They will have had generally to take a decision as to whether they would like their inventions or their discoveries to be taken forward through technology transfer. Once they've taken that decision, they should as much as possible be free to focus back on their research, giving input on the research aspects of the development of the project, but not having to train to be somebody who writes a patent from A to Z. They, they contribute to the writing of the patent, but they shouldn't have to write it themselves. They shouldn't be 
the, the chief scientific officer of a startup company. It's a different job than being a research scientist. They shouldn't have to do both. And it's really, I think it's, it's, it's um, very, very difficult to try to do the two things in parallel, even if your institution allows you to do that and share your time. Um, then, once the technology transfer company has, or professionals have generated IP, they need to know the market for the IP. They need to know which are the companies that might license this or might buy it outright if that's the chosen way to obtain value from the IP. Who are the other institutions, research institutions mainly, but, of, but sometimes also small or large companies, who have complementary IP? who it might be possible to do things together with. Luigi mentioned an example of this in his presentation. It's a very common thing to do, to consolidate complementary IP, to make a better package, because it's more easy to take the project forward if you have a stronger patent portfolio and a stronger set of projects and results. And the technology transfer professionals have to know this. So they have to, in total, this is not one person usually, but in total they have to be somebody who talks to the scientists. The scientists, the researchers, have to trust them. In other words, they have to be able to, to act and behave in a way that generates trust among the scientists that they're working with. That's why they have to be embedded in the institution, the institute where the, the work is done, in my opinion. Um, and that trust, and it was mentioned also during the earlier part of the session, this necessity to build up trust among the different partners who really think in very different ways at different stages of the, of the process is extremely important in successfully, eventually, taking something to market. And, and finally, um, they need patience because although in some areas, particularly in areas like technology development, IT, uh, the, time to, the time from discovery to market can be relatively short. That's very unusual in, for example, the life science sector. And if you're talking about a drug, you're talking about a minimum of 15 years. Uh, I don't know what the, the gene technology timelines are, but very similar, I would guess. Surprising. Surprising. I've seen, seen that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even, you know, if you've, if you've built a new kind of microscope, and, and you work with a company to put this, or set up a company to put the microscope onto market, you're, you're talking about 10 years from the time you have your prototype microscope until you have it on the market. And that's if things go well. So it's, um, it's a difficult profession. It's a very, very valuable profession. And I think anything that we as human technopol can do to contribute to the development of the culture that supports innovation, uh, we'll be very happy to do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jan Matai and to this further reminder of the crucial importance of technology transfer and of the professionalities of, of technology transfer. So we are, we are at the end of the afternoon. If, I mean, if there is anyone who has a very urgent question for, for, our, uh, for our speakers today, and uh, we have, I think, one last opportunity, five minutes maybe, to, to ask it. Um, otherwise, we don't want to keep you here too long. So I will just take the opportunity to once again thanks all our speakers today. Uh, Fabio Terragni, Riccardo Pietramissa, Luigi Naldini, and of course Jan Mattai. Thanks to everyone. Tomorrow um, you, you will have another 
day, full day, packed with uh, with great uh, talks. Uh, I, I won't be here moderating, unfortunately for me, but uh, I recommend you to, to follow the whole program, which will begin tomorrow at 10 a.m. with the Maria Grazia Roncarolos talk. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for following us today, and uh, have a nice evening. Thanks a lot. <laughs>